having a look into both worlds, the engineering world as well as in the pilot world, sometimes is challenging, if you know what I mean. Dear Chairman, Dr. Christopher, the audience, uh, even this is a, a surveillance session, I'm happy to uh, give you a presentation reflecting <coughs> mission avionics on uh, mission platforms in, in a more general way. If you talk about uh, mission platforms, uh, what do we have in mind? For sure, fighter aircraft uh, as the most famous uh, mission Aircraft. My colleagues sometimes say fighter aircraft uh, is a number of sensors, uh, uh, an enormous processing power, and a big engine and some wings around. Helicopter is a different story. Helicopter could be a combat uh, version, could be a transport version. Uh, transport aircraft is more a platform where we can imagine this operates also not only in a military but also in a commercial or civil environment. And last but not least, and this is a topic of the session today, um, surveillance aircraft. Surveillance, again, is a different uh, approach. Uh, surveillance has to, or this type of platform has to transport a lot of high sensitive sensors, a lot of processing power, has to do some intelligence and has to deliver the right information of the surrounding world. If we go back in the history a little bit, uh, fighter aircrafts were designed according to pure military needs and standards and requirements, not taking care of any civil or commercial regulations. <clears throat> this was an example out of the, the late 80s. Uh, if you go step further into the mid-90s, there was a slightly change in the avionics philosophy. And here the cockpit avionics is shown because most of you identify cockpits when they hear the word avionics, um, even if it's still more than only the cockpit. Um, in, the, in the 90s, there was an opening to uh, use more commercial Elements instead of pure military designs on board of an aircraft driven by cost, driven by development time and risk. And if you go further on the time scale today, uh, we, we can find, uh, let me say, the latest or state-of-the-art version of avionics cockpit. This uh, example is 400M uh, transport aircraft. <clears throat> These avionics is more or less a copy of what we know from the civil world. Everything which is on board of such a bird can be found uh, on a civil aircraft as well. What is the difference between the basic vehicle avionics and the mission avionics? Basic vehicle, uh, you can explain it to fly the aircraft from A to B and to follow civil rules, civil regulations, civil air traffic management and air co traffic control um, standards. And if you, if you keep in mind that most of the flying hours are performed under peace conditions, and I hope this will be the, the case in the future too, uh, it's clear that uh, there is a certain emphasis on having uh, commercial or having systems on board which, which fit into the modern uh, ATM, ATC world. But this is only one part of the story. The other part is the platform has to fulfill its mission. And an uh, aircraft having be fitted with commercial avionics is not able to make low-level flight like a tactical transport aircraft. It's not able to make airdrop. So there are certain elements needed to perform the mission. And the interaction between the basic vehicle avionics and the mission avionics um, is the element which has to be uh, investigated to have on one hand side uh, a good approach for the basic vehicle avionics and to have on the other hand side a well-designed and developed mission package for the mission needs, for the military needs. All this has to be done 
considering that more and more these type of platforms um, have to be or shall be certified according to civil regulations because they operate most of the time in civil airspaces. And <clears throat> the military community wants to take credit of the civil development processes, the civil integration and certification processes. Again, with respect to cost and time for such a development. It surely makes a difference if we have a transport aircraft as one example and a surveillance aircraft as another. As I uh, mentioned, the, the interconnection between mission and uh, basic vehicle avionics on a transport aircraft is maybe much higher than the interaction between the surveillance systems on board of an airborne early warning aircraft, for example, with the common avionics um, part of the story. Um, even if there are some interactions, the challenges on a transport aircraft seems to be much higher. This has shown the experience we have gathered in in several uh, military transport aircraft projects. One approach to handle basic vehicle avionics and mission avionics, and I, I say it's only one approach, it's not the only one, but it's a, a proven approach to separate everything what helps to fly from A to B and to have a certain package to fulfill the mission. That means that we will find all the elements, all the architecture uh, characteristics of the uh, civil part of the story in the avionics concept of a transport aircraft as well as on a, on a mission aircraft. That means today the, the direction goes to um, onboard Ethernet communication between the units, we have all the standard flight management uh, functionalities on board um, which are required today and in the future from uh, civil ATM, ATC regulations like, like the famous Next Gen uh, program in US or the Single European Sky uh, Aeronautical Research Program in, in uh, Europe. And there are other uh, research projects around the world dealing with modernization and harmonization of air traffic management and air traffic control. And this common standard aircraft package, avionic package, has to fit into these new and upcoming regulations. Nevertheless, we need uh, our mission avionics designed to mission needs. That means we have certain types of sensors on board which are not typically on board of a commercial aircraft, if you think about self-protection, or if you think about certain sensors, or if you think about a certain types of, of armament. Um, having these functions separated and managed by an own, what we call, federated subsystem helps to, to uh, design a clear avionics concept following the certification rules for both parts of the avionics, for the common standard aircraft avionic as well as for the mission avionics. And if you go down from the architecture to the elements, to the components, in the past there was a clear rule, one box, one function on board of an aircraft. This is not any longer valid. We all know uh, from today's um, uh, standardization processes that it is um, a goal and the need to have a higher level of integration um, of functions on the available processing power on board of an aircraft. This allows, according to today's civil standards, to integrate different applications uh, on one hardware architecture. That means also we can achieve a higher integration in functionality and a better integration uh, and a reduction of LRUs, LRUs on board of the aircraft, and that at the end means reduction of weight, reduction of power consumption. 
integrated model of ionics is uh, a buzzword you uh, can hear uh, anyhow when uh, people discuss about this type of functional integration. But be careful, if people talk about IMA or integrated modular ionic, ask carefully what they mean. Uh, it can mean to use more or less common uh, modules with a certain processing power, with a certain performance, and using these modules in, in cabinet <coughs> integration and uh, implementing different applications on these common uh, uh, core modules. The other interpretation of integrated and open structures could be to have a well-known LIU concept, but having a certain freedom to combine hardware and software within such LIUs to the certain need of an avionics architecture. Even that leads to a more robust and a more compact avionics design, avionics architecture, robust against obsolescence, robust against integration of uh, additional functionalities or adaptation to upcoming mission needs, not having the problem in front that what I call monolithic solutions where everything comes out of one hand controls the entire avionics. If we talk about modular and open in that sense, this gives a real advantage to system designs and developments. Uh, this becomes more, uh, more detailed. What does it mean to implement different functionalities um, in, in one LRU or on one uh, hardware platform? This means not only different functions, but only also different functions with different design assurance levels. Uh, today, uh, I would say it is possible and standard to integrate uh, DAL B to DAL D software applications on one computer. To integrate uh, uh, flight critical functionalities today show one or the other limitation and uh, the workaround is to use dedicated hardware to realize uh, DAL-R uh, functionalities within such an architecture. Another important aspect is, and this has been mentioned several times today, <coughs> the involvement of all the stakeholders in a development process. And the development process starts not only with, with writing uh, specifications, it starts analyzing requirements. The user requirements may be to discuss uh, the consequences of con-ops to the system layout, to the system architecture, to the system and component designs. Involving all stakeholders mean also that there is a, a workflow around this, you know, this V diagram or this V process, starting with the analysis. Uh, followed by the system design, followed by the equipment design, system equipment development or procurement, the integration, the validation and verification at, at the end of this V diagram, the qualification. This means that most of the stakeholders should be involved on more or less all, nearly all, not the level zero, the aircraft level, but all the levels uh, below the aircraft level should be involved in this process to ensure the best way, the best economic uh, approach for uh, uh, high-end system design of avionics. Concluding all what I've said um, can be bring in four points. There is a trend to segregate basic vehicle and mission avionics to a certain extent, maybe uh, to less extent on a fighter platform, to a high extent on a transport platform. There is a certain trend to use civil standards even for military platforms and applications, to take credit from civil certification processes. That means also to take credit of 
civil design processes, including all the steps from the definition, from the design, from the review work, from the interaction with authorities. And <clears throat> the next point is to use open architectures to make systems robust against obsolescence, to make software and hardware independent from each other, and last but not least, to be flexible, to adapt the mission systems to upcoming mission needs. And the last point is to be open even for third-party suppliers when they can bring in certain or special functionalities. Having an open concept, this is not any longer a problem uh, compared to monolithic approaches where everything is controlled by typically only one supplier. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vipich. Uh, you nicely brought out how we can encash the outcome of the civilian certification for the military application. Is there anywhere it is existing already? Is it the ADS practice already to utilize that, or it's only a thought process? Um, this is already the praxis. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the European Transport Aircraft Project, uh, the A400M, it's an aircraft design made by Airbus, and Airbus has invited all relevant subsystem supplier to work together with Airbus on the design and the development of that aircraft and A400M will be, I guess, the first, if I'm right, the first military transport aircraft getting a Part 25 certification from the U European Certification Authority, EASA. Okay. Maybe AWH also along with you. Any questions from anybody? Then I have one more question. Uh, you said that the obsolescence are controlled by going for a COTS approach. Is it true or is it uh, military boards are generally for a longer duration? Our, our experience is that a military platform is in operation over typically more than 30 years. And we know from today's environment that mission needs change much earlier, much faster. Sometimes we have to adapt functionalities in a time frame of 10 years or 15 years or sometimes um, in a much shorter time frame. <clears throat> and and this, is, uh, this comes along with doing new designs for the uh, computing power on board of an aircraft, doing new designs for sensors and for sensor integration. This is open concepts. It is feasible to use more standardized components to use standardized interfacings between sensors and the processing uh, elements. And this gives exactly this flexibility to adapt the platform to the mission and to avoid obsolescence. Thank you very much.